maybe I will also quickly introduce you. I'm probably <laughs> probably most of you uh, know Maxim already. So he's a uh, one of the um, or one of the members of the uh, organizing um, committee of the uh, MRI Together workshop, and uh, I guess the current official affiliation is still Vienna. Um, and um, yeah, uh, his talk will be about or the hands-on session will will be about the um, yeah Pulsec on Siemens, and um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm very interested. Um, what we will see. And um, yeah, I also invite everybody to turn on the camera, I guess. So it's more like an interactive session. And I guess it's nice for everyone if we yeah, can see each other. And um, yeah, and uh, go on. <laughs> Put on your cameras, it's a hands-on session and you can all ask questions. So don't be shy. Okay, yeah. So thank you, Patrick. Thank you for the introduction and uh... Okay, thanks to all of you guys for joining the session. I would really like to interact in this session. So please, please ask questions, please interrupt uh, or, you know, use this uh, reactions uh, uh, tool to, to let me know that you have a question and I'll try to, to really answer. Uh, but uh, before we start, let me maybe start with a, uh, with a question to you. Uh, uh, I would like to see what the, what's your background, what's your expectation from the session. So maybe can can people please uh, raise their their hands, you know, do the hand raising uh, thing in in uh, um, in Zoom um, when I, when I ask questions. So um, how many of you don't know what Pulsic is? I don't see any hands. Um, so that make, makes makes it a little bit easier with the initial introduction. That's good. So how many of you did use Pulse Pulse already? Uh, I see, see quite a few hands, um, but not not too many. So roughly roughly half or so. Great. Okay. Um, so I. Um, and how many of you actually have some some burning question to to ask? So we, where we could maybe go in in depth uh, uh, in some concrete discussion. So if you, well, let's see at least a couple of hands. Okay, so we'll reserve some time for that, or try to keep some uh, some open window at the end. Okay, but with that, uh, let me let me start. Uh, start my uh, session. Um, so as Patrick have correctly told, I am in Vienna now. I will start in Freiburg in January, but for now uh, we are in Vienna and you are virtually present in Vienna. I will switch the camera such that you would really see the environment. So if, you, if you've been to uh, to Vienna, any uh, anywhere we are in the old, this is kind of well-known uh, wooden hut building. Uh, this is a historical, uh, historical um, high-field uh, building which started many many years ago when the magnets were still unshielded, and that's why it's completely wooden building. And next to this building, there's a second building with the seven Tesla. And uh, behind the monitor, you may be, be able to see the Prisma FIT scanner. That's a 3 Tesla scanner, which will operate during the session today. So, and we can really do it together. I'll explain in a few moments how we do that. So the camera now showing the screen of the, of the, uh, the, the console screen. So you will really be able to see that everything that we do today is, is for real. Okay. Um, so, but before we do that, I would say, let, let us, let me start maybe 10, 15 minutes and rush quickly through the Pulsic introduction slides to really bring everybody to the same page. So you would guys, you would know what we are talking about. I am, I mean, most of the people have heard of Pulsic, but uh, maybe it would really be a good idea to, uh, to make sure that we have, uh, have the same picture. Okay, 
So I share my screen and uh, you should be able to see the slides. Um, okay, so this is the slide deck, which I uh, also uh, had uh, before slightly modified for this purpose. Um, that is about 20 slides and I will really go so quickly through that, but please, uh, Please ask me if, if, if you really have a burning question, just, just ask it loud um, to see, uh, uh, to, to ask some questions or to may, maybe have me slow down a tiny bit. So um, yeah, I have nothing to disclose uh, and the slides will be published as the, uh, as the open, uh, open content. So what I want to uh, show you, very briefly is the pulse philosophy, what we actually define in the sequence, how we define the sequence, and which tools we use to, to do that. And then I will show you more about uh, uh, the setup for running the sequences. And then we'll, uh, if the time permits, we'll try to really go from scratch from a gradient echo sequence, which we define uh, block by block to, to an API sequence within the residual 20 minutes. So, why we uh, uh, define Pulsec, why we uh, use it and the way how we define it and use it is that we want to remove the initial threshold in sequence programming. We want to lower the starting, flatten the learning curve in the beginning or really try to make simple things simple um, and then uh, have the complexity scale up uh, slowly uh, and linearly. We also would like to, to make complex things which we researchers need and maybe not, not the product sequence designers need more and more accessible. So uh, things like arbitrary RF pulses, arbitrary gradients, uh, really crazy reordering options or using uh, non-proton uh, nuclei to do imaging or spectroscopy. And uh, in, in my experience of, uh, of uh, guiding students, I, uh, I also have seen many, many types of mistakes people make in their sequences. So I would like to prevent the typical errors which you have in the sequence. And that's very typical that you get parts of your sequences are uh, get out of synchrony or, or don't do whatever you want to do. Or the sequence does one thing, but the reconstruction assumes something totally different. So we try to, to avoid those uh, uh, uncertainties. And uh, of course, because we provide this environment, we eventually would also like to save work for ourselves. So basically we would like to minimize the um, implementation effort. That's why, so we, we, we don't have, it, it's more or less a hobby project for us. So we don't, to, we don't have time to implement something very complex and fully blown as, as this interface. So, uh, the solution to that was to really to, to focus on a very lean, on the very, very minimalistic interface, how to uh, link the sequence, the, our researchers idea of what the pulse sequence is to the hardware. So we do that uh, by using this pulse file. Uh, and uh, uh, around this pulse file, we built up a cross-platform uh, uh, programming framework. It, uh, uh, basically, the, the, the solution is that the PulseIC file is very, very low level. Um, and uh, we use some high level tools to create this uh, low level file. And then we use interpreters to play those uh, files out on some particular hardware. And there's some, some uh, links to basically two most uh, advanced um, options to create um, the files currently. They do. But I'll, I'll come later to that uh, again. So uh, no, once again, an overview. So we basically have several tools to define uh, PulseIC files. And we will focus in, in my talk today on, on the uh, MATLAB PulseIC interface. Um, there, but there are other, at least two uh, actively used options are PyPulseIC and Toppy. Uh, we create a PulseIC file, and then we can play it out on, on the variety of, of hardware uh, arch architectures. And today we will use uh, Siemens as we've seen. So uh, to make it possible, we basically created this, this pieces of puzzle. So we have the programming environment with 
fits to the Pulsec file, and uh, we have an interpreter module which can also uh, connect to the Pulsec file. So let's start with the central bit here. Uh, the Pulsec file is a really very, very explicit specification of the pulse sequence. So if you think of it, it's not, uh, it's not uh, sheet music, it's not your notes to play uh, something uh, on the piano where you can still apply some variations. It's really, uh, it's, it's a sound file. Uh, it's like a lossless capture of, of your pulse sequence. There's no loops, no parameters, no dependencies, nothing. Everything is absolutely predefined. And we define it as a text file because sometimes if, if you're uh, if you're debugging your development tool, you won't be able to just uh, fiddle around with some some parameters uh, or at least understand what's going on. Uh, we also like the this text file to be easily readable by the hardware because we would like to support some very old and primitive scanners which have no crazy uh, modern libraries installed or compilable for them. So basically, that's uh, that this, this is a motivation. And important thing, we uh, try to keep the specification of this file format open and up to date, which is also available in the Pulsic uh, website. So how we define the pulse sequence, and that's really really important. We take the continuous timing uh, and uh, split it into slices, which we call blocks. And every block is allowed to contain one RF pulse one gradient pulse per axis uh, or one ADC pulse, ADC event, or a combination of these three. So it, it's actually a bit of a uh, wrong uh, representation here. We draw, uh, there's one RF line, but in Pulsic actually you can have the ADC and uh, RF in the same block. Just time shifted such that you don't uh, receive during the RF pulse. Um, but uh, another important point is that the blocks don't require the gradient pulses to come down to zero. So a ref and ADC are not allowed to cross the block boundaries and actually even have to implement a tiny bit of delays on both sides. We'll, we'll maybe talk about that later. Um, but the gradients can actually freely cross the, the edges. Uh, to make it possible, you have to split your gradients into bits and pieces, and we'll again talk about it in the um, in the tutorial. Okay, so now how we create these files? Uh, we, uh, like I said before, we use uh, MATLAB or Python most of the time, and here are also the links to the uh, corresponding websites. And there are a few more options like Topi or Gamma Star. We've heard about that already. Uh, uh, John Frederick will present um, um, Topi uh, today in the afternoon uh, in the Europe and in, well, it depends where you are in the world, it may be different time, but it's basically the 12 hours shifted session. Um, and also in, in that session, in the theoretical part of it, well, there'll be a presentation on PyPol6. So be sure not to miss those. But also there may, may be a few more options to produce a Pulsic files listed here. So how does it look in MATLAB? Basically what you do is just write a little metric MATLAB script and you know for people programming under Siemens, uh, you know, believe it or not, this is a runnable sequence. It's a very minimalistic, it's not ideal. It will maybe have some artifacts uh, due to uh, insufficient spalling, for example, but it will produce an image. Uh, and how we do it, we basically define the system properties in the beginning, we define high level parameters, but it's more or less convenient. You can really write everything with numbers if you feel like. Uh, and yeah, just define your pulses, calculate the delays and maybe reord reordering tables if you need them and just go through the loops the way you like it. You can have multiple loops. You can have everything written in the spaghetti code, basically fill up the, uh, the block table. And then you produce, you export the file, you, uh, to export the sequence to the text file and then you copy the text file to the scanner. And like I said, the screenshot is really a, a complete sequence which is comparable to Simmons' uh, example, mini flash in the initial, in its initial state. So, but to run it on the, uh, on the scanner, we need an interpreter module. That module which will read in this 
.cq file and convert them into the hardware-specific instructions. That's basically what it does. It's just a normal pulse sequence. Uh, it loads its content from the pulse file. And uh, uh, so it still has a user interface but because Siemens requires these sequences to have a user interface, but you uh, basically can cannot use any of the fields like to change TE or TR or whatever. It, it, it's not possible. Um, important thing, it's not based on any product code, so and there's no hacks or backdoors or whatever. So basically, it's really a normal sequence, and we don't do anything unusual inside of the sequence. And we distribute that sequence as a C2P package in the source code form. So if you like to use it, you will get it, and you can basically modify it. If you find some bugs, please uh, report them to us or send your fixes, and we'll try to include it into the next release. We also use very standard SAR calculation, and we also uh, have an option to apply this gradient safety library of Siemens, which is not used in many product sequences, but in uh, sequences like diffusion, to make sure that you don't burn your gradients. And in PulseIQ, you can actually apply it to any sequence. It slows down your interpreter, but it will actually work. So basically, we have the safety standards uh, in the PulseIQ, which are at least as high as uh, as the um, as for the standard uh, sequences uh, for the semen sequences. Um, okay. So uh, now, how you implement it on the scanner, and what you'll see today in in the demo. Basically, we have a scanner, and has a scanner has some uh, real time controller behind the cabinets. Uh, yeah. We we have a console, of course which you see on the camera, I guess, still. And uh, um, uh, next to the console, uh, uh, that's me sitting with this little laptop. Uh, I have MATLAB running on the laptop. I'll be producing the Pulsec file, and we will transfer it to the uh, console and the real-time controller, actually, uh, via the internal network link. Uh, I will not go into detail how to do that. We also cannot really. Uh, disclose that information. It's possible to do, but you have to fiddle around a tiny bit if you like to do it. However, in the, in the new policy interpreter, it actually doesn't. It's not necessary because you can pre-install many many sequences and select them uh, from the drop box, uh, drop down menu. So you then run the interpreter sequence on the scanner, and will catch the data generated by the scanner using an H data catcher in real time. Again, it's an optional thing, but it's really a very convenient option. And in today's demo, this, this data cache is actually connected to the, uh, to the Dropbox, so you can actually see the data in real time as, as we play with them. Uh, you can, of course, export the raw data manually as well. Um, so we can also do the uh, interpreter in the um, Siemens ID environment. And uh, you can save uh, the uh, file. Basically, you have to create this. Uh, pass on your system and save the file to this to that location. And then if you run the simulator, you can basically simulate the sequence also in idea. And again, on my laptop, I have this setup. If there's some questions, we can have a look and I will show you how to do that again. So in terms of the uh, scanners, we support all current scanners I'm aware of uh, uh, on, on the Siemens, in the Siemens portfolio, we have more, more than 40 uh, distributed uh, sites working with us. We support both Numaris 4 and Numaris 10. Uh, and the uh, Pulsec was even tested on the Freemax uh, and all other modern and older sequences. So on last Saturday, for example, I scanned on the Trio in, in Freiburg. And today we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be working on this based on uh, Prisma. Okay, so uh, Maxim, Maxim, a quick question um, there yeah. in the chat. Um, if the Siemens interpreter is available online or if you need to get this from Siemens? It's, it is available uh, via the Siemens online sharing platform, which is called uh, TeamPlay. So if the university is subscribed to Team, TeamPlay, oh, actually, I have a wrong camera. Uh, uh, look, let me see. Oh, where is my. Oh, here you are. Here you. Uh, so if the university is subscribed to, to, to the TeamPlay system, um, then 
Um, that's that's strange. Uh, then you can um, you can basically get it uh, on the same day. Uh, so you send the request by the system, and I, I have to approve it, or somebody from from uh, from our university has to approve it, and then you can download it. Otherwise, you have to go through this uh, standard C2P process, which can be as quick as one week, or it can take also some time. Okay. Um, so I would say we are more or less through with what I wanted to show you. Oh, but basically uh, there, there was one most uh, important slide. So basically I collected some links here and probably most importantly are the links to the today's materials. But again, we'll, we'll go through that in a few moments. And um, uh, I'm also really like to show off with this uh, slide, uh, basically, Pulsic is, is, uh, has its limitations, but it, what it allows you is to uh, implement your sequence in, in, in a few hours. And if you dream of a crazy sequence in the morning, you can see how the images come out uh, by the lunchtime. So um, let me show you a few more things then. I, I actually, I stopped sharing for a moment because I noticed, so somehow, uh, why am I I'm not allowed to stop sharing? What's going on? New sharing. Was, uh, am I still sharing? Well, we don't see your slides, but we see the screen. Okay, from, yes. From the scanner. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you see the... We see the console. You see yeah. the console. Okay, and... Uh, so. Uh, the, so Zoom is doing something very strange to me <laughs> here. Okay. So if I, and now you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Now we can see the slides again. Now you see the slides. Okay. I wanted to, to switch to a different camera, but it's, it doesn't do it. So, you know, if, if, you, if you don't like what's going on, please file a bug uh, at... Uh, um, uh, Zoom. So we'll we'll use MATLAB. Can you see the? Can you read the uh, font in MATLAB? Is it not? Uh, like some people complain that my letters are too small. I tried to use a different laptop with a lower resolution today. I hope I hope the text is still legible. For so, for me, it's okay. Yeah. Maybe okay. another question question, Maxime from the chat to the interpreters, if for Canon and Philips. Um, if they, there are plans um, or if they are available already or if there are plans to... Well, they, we, we are working on... on we, we, we submitted the IE on an IH grant where we plan to develop um, a Philips interpreter. And uh, we are talking to, uh, to some people at Canon to see whether we can allocate some resources. So uh, we would be happy to support it. But we need some people uh, to team up with us uh, to, to actually do that. And we have some strategic uh, collaboration with, uh, with the Philips site. Um, so we're waiting for the NH to, to give us money. Uh, by the way, anyone can just ask questions. Yeah, so you, you, you can write them in the chat, but you can also ask Maxime, Maxime directly. Exactly. OK, so before we go, basically, uh, your uh, what I wanted to say is the, the materials, the hands-on, which we'll be looking at is, uh, is here. We, uh, it's on GitHub. Um, and you can get there from basically going to the main Pulsex site. And if you click on this, you will, that's what will open here. And uh, in this page, we have some, what's going on? I have to reload this one. Yeah. Okay, that looks better. Uh, we have some instructions, uh, what to do and how to do. And may, most important, basically, we have a link to the main repository. So please get it if you want to follow it uh, uh, completely. We also have the Dropbox, Dropbox links for the data which we'll measure. And also, if somebody really is able to generate a sequence within the session, Please uh, upload it to the uh, upload Dropbox uh, folder and let me know, and we can even uh, try to run it in the scanner together. Okay. So um, 
and in the uh, in this uh, Dropbox, we we will have we have the pre-recorded data which I acquired before, and uh, some with some example reconstructions, and we will try to populate this directory with the same uh, things uh, to die. And the, as you see, I already uh, did a quick uh, test run in the in the morning to see whether the scanner is actually working. Okay. So, um, at this point, without further ado, if there's no any, any questions, I can uh, try to show you how things work, right? So here we start with the first uh, pulse X sequence, which I've prepared. Actually also you know, in terms of uh, creating, basically I've created this uh, demo from scratch uh, in uh, one afternoon. Uh, so uh, uh, we basically will look today at uh, four or five sequences uh, and go step by step increasing the complexity. Um, but that's basically the time scale. If you're familiar with the framework, you can really create your sequences from the beginning and not by taking some very complicated pro product sequences and look for the place where you change a few lines and then hope you did the right change and uh, you hope your code is actually used in any situations. It's, it's, it's totally a different approach with Pulsic and I really would like you to learn to enjoy it. So uh, how you do it in Pulsic, you first uh, specify your system and it's very important that you don't uh, be too greedy. So in this case, we will limit the maximum gradient to 28 millidesta per meter because it doesn't make sense to read, uh, uh, to use very high gradients for the gradient echo sequence. We also uh, don't use a maximum slew rate because that will make the pulses actually look a bit more real and the sequence will be a little bit quieter. Um, it's also very important if you want a runnable sequence, um, then you have to, um, I have to slow the thing. I will remove that. Um, you have to define some of the system limitations, the constraints. For example, the um, ring down time of your of your RF uh, subsystem, which is uh, 20 milliseconds, microseconds um, typical, and the dead time, that the time before the RF pulse can be played out, which is 100 microseconds, again, for many uh, Siemens scanners. And also the ADC events have to be surrounded by some delays. They are not allowed to touch the boundaries of the blocks. Uh, and this uh, is 10 microseconds in, in our case. And on different scanners, it, these delays can be different. So, but after we did that- we Maybe a quick question, Maxime. Yeah. Um, as you just said, so the, the settings are different for, for every scanner. Um, have you thought about introducing a dictionary where the um, limitations of the different Siemens scanners at least are, are stored so that yeah people know what to use? Um, well, we're still learning that also for us. Um, because, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a good idea. I, uh, we didn't do it up to now, uh, but uh, it's, it's probably uh, something we should really um, think how, to how we build up um, this, this kind of a knowledge base in, in, in the future. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay, so um, basically what you do then is that you define a sequence object that's is done here and then you define some convenience parameters but this is totally up to you you can also just use the constant directly when you generate things however if you want to change something later it's still a good idea to have things like flip angle or tetr uh, on that external level um, and then you can maybe have some more advanced parameters if you feel like for example using the rf duration or readout duration that defines your bandwidth and that's actually one of the tricky parts because uh, Siemens scanners, they have some limitations on the duration of your RF uh, pulses and, uh, and especially the ADC pulses. So ADC samples have to be aligned to, to some rust, internal raster. Um, so you have to really check whether things are valid and show uh, later how to do that. But, um, at this point, we will first try to generate our sequence and you basically generate your RF pulse. And the nice thing about makes uh, sync uh, 
pulse function is that it can actually generate um, the uh, gradients uh, to, to it. And uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with that, you already have uh, your excitation, slice selective excitation defined. The next step is that we define some kind of imaging parameters, for example, delta k in this case. And uh, um, important thing is also our units are really made uh, such that you, you don't have to fiddle around with gamma or whatever. So the, the k space is defined in inverse meters. The gradients are defined in hertz per meter. And that makes many calculations very easy. Basically, you define, you define one over field of view, and that's your delta k uh, and things like that. So, Basically, uh, by using the delta k, you can now uh, know your areas uh, of your gradients. So you define your areas, you define your spoilers, you do some calculations uh, for the delays, and then you loop through the timing and define your object block by block. And the important thing is that at this point, you can create any kind of, uh, you can still be creating objects in the loop if you feel like. It will be less lower performance because it will take time. So MATLAB will use time for creating objects, but you can do that. So some PALSEC will, will be able to generate the file still. Okay. And then I said, it's a good idea to, uh, we can actually run this block for now. So you can also appreciate that it's very fast. So the sequence now is fully generated. It's, it's in memory and you can see the objects defined here and that's the entire sequence is already there. But what we do before we do any further work is to actually check that our parameters are correct. And this is done by this check timing, call and block. And you see timing check uh, passed successfully. Uh, this check timing function checks whether the objects are aligned to the gradient raster, with, whether the ADC timing is appropriate and, and uh, other things. So whatever you do, your sequences, please always check whether this is correct. Then we can define high level parameters for the for the expert and maybe have a look at the sequence. So here's the beginning of my sequence. Uh, let me see. So that's the timing. And again, uh, the timing window looks like we have the ADC events, we have our ref pulses, our ref phase, and the gradient pulses on every axis. And you can nicely zoom in uh, into the timing to see more of the inner life of your sequence, okay? Um, and one thing I really like to look at is the case space. Again, we're looking now at the entire case space of the sequence and the red dots uh, visualize the sampled pulses. You can see the initial prephasers and then the actual readouts. So you can really see in, in a lot of details what's going on with every, every shot. Okay, so um, what we do at this point? Oh, so we can also do more checks and this is actually relatively slow because it will now uh, generate the entire timing and look into many details of the sequence. It's called sequence report. And this function tries to figure out what your sequence is doing in, in different ways. It will also check the maximum slew rates and uh, so whether you actually uh, stayed within the limits. So let's have a look at the output. So it says some general information, how many blocks, how many objects we have and so on. What is the total duration of the sequence? What is the TE? It's four milliseconds. That's exactly what we specified, TR21. Flip angle, it looks at the case space matrix and try to detect whether it's a uh, uh, Cartesian sequence or whatever, but what was the resolution and so on and so forth. And then it gives a block about um, gives out a block about the maximum uh, slew rates and gradient amplitudes. So I would say we are at the point where we can actually install the sequence on the scanner. And in my connected network situation, we can, I can do that. So the sequence install, it once won't goes to the scanner. So you see the interface of the scanner, I hope. We open the pulse sequence. So that's a sequence on the scanner. We have the normal user interface. You can also position your slices or do whatever. Uh, but most of the parameters are not working here. They're not doing anything. And what you are interested in is a sequence special. So do you see my mouse? Do you see the screen? Uh, we see your MATLAB uh, screen. Oh, okay. So if I stop sharing. Yes. 
so so now you see uh, you see the console. So what? Uh, okay, I'll close this guy again. Is is the resolution sufficient that you can actually see what's happening? So I'm I'm cloning the last uh, ran protocol. I'm opening the protocol. So most of these uh, parameters they are not effective. They are not doing anything. But you can position your slices. Um, I go back to the other center for the example. Um, uh, you can switch, you can change the basic orientation, or you can go to the sequence special. And this is really your home in the Pulsic uh, world. You can, for example, select some of the pre-installed sequences, but we will use the external because this one is re automatically replaced in our demo. Um, and then you can run the sequence in, and we say the data will be automatically exported to back to MATLAB. Um, I would say at this point, we don't need many more many more options we just run the sequence could you hear it was running okay so now i will share again share my screen oh no it's not sharing share so can you see my uh, desktop again? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, here that's the output of my data catcher. So there was a script which is waiting for the incoming data and it says, well, the raw data are coming. It recognized the signature on the file and it received the data and also picked up the, um, um, the sequence file in the background. So if we go back, we can see what's happening in the live data. You see, we have a data set which was just measured a few seconds ago and that contains a dead file and CQ file. And now we can take the Fourier transform uh, script to run off, over it. So the way the script is set up, we say where it fetches the data from, it scans the directory for the files, and uh, it's configured to, uh, to reconstruct the last data set. If you want the second last, you can use minus one. If you want the first, you just say one here and you can go through the examples here. Uh, so we will now look at the last data set measured. That's our case space trajectory, exactly what we, we did before and that's our data. So that's the sequence which was, we just ran a few moments ago. Um, so, at this point, I would say we, we have the tool at our hands, so I can, I can show you other sequences, uh, how you do this, uh, or we can, I can answer the questions. I noticed we're already quite advanced in terms of the time. Um, so if there are questions, I can answer. If there are no questions, we can, we can go back to the sequence. If, if I might, might just take uh, the question that I put in the, in the chat as well, Maxim. Yeah. Um, thanks for the demo. I, I just wondering, the you opened the, the parameter card on the scanner. Can you actually change uh, single parameters like TE or TR on the scanner? Or is it something you need to run through the? No, um, you can you you can't you can't change any TE or TR. Okay, I'll probably show you briefly again which which parameters you can change. Um, um in that's probably easier to do here so i'm i'm sharing my screen right zoom is showing something very strange to me so i'm, I'm not sure what what i do uh so can you see my shared screen or you see the yeah we see the uh poet now okay so poet is coming up yeah it's slow but it's slow not because of policy it's always slow uh, in this installation Ach, come on. Okay. So uh, here you can basically change uh, the orientation and and the other parameters are all in, not not used. We I, in the earlier versions I actually tried to disable them, but that it's really very happy, very easy to get the scanner upset if you disable the parameters which it expects to be to be alive. So we stopped doing that, uh, um, but basically it's only the orientation which can be changed. 
you know, we, we give the sequence as a source code. If somebody manages to, to make this, all these parameters invisible, please, please do that. They will not confuse, confuse people. One thing which is possible, so you can select uh, that, and this is really a new feature of the new interpreter, which is available since a few weeks, is the selection of uh, this drop down list. So it basically will look at the sequences which are already pre installed, and you can run any of the sequences uh, in, in real time, or you select it and it runs. Um, you can do what tap, whether it will be real time, real start, or like waiting sequence. It's, you have to read up. Uh, and then you can say whether the clip angles so timing can be adapted a tiny bit. Uh, again, it's a bit advanced feature. You probably don't need it so often. You can enable or disable field of view positioning. You can predefine how the rotation matrices are uh, interpreted. You can say whether you, you use a, a leap balance. You can actually repeat the pulse file multiple times. So if you want to do fMRI, you basically create a sequence, which should be a multi-slice package of, uh, of echoplanar images. And then you run it multiple times um, by, by saying the number of runs here. You can also introduce a delay between the runs. This is a very special sequence uh, parameter. We don't need to talk about it right now, but that basically for spirals, you need to segment your case by your ADC into several IDCs that this internal workings of the Siemens, it cannot be done otherwise. Um, but they also, it's rather, in the meantime, you actually don't have to change this parameter by hand. You can control it from MATLAB completely. And then the nice thing, uh, which is new again in, the, in this interpreter is that you can apply gradient scaling on, on the scanner directly. So if you produce a sequence, but you want to change the field of view, or you want to disable phase encoding. So you can go, for example, for the second uh, axis and set the scaling to zero or you know, do things like that. So you can basically a uh, tiny bit fit around with your sequence, but that says basically all, everything else is pretty fine completely. Okay. Thanks. Good. Um, so I would say at this point, I will maybe show you a few more examples. So we, we run the, the sequence again, but now we use the array of TEs. And this is implemented such that we will have a, in the sequence, we have an inner loop, which actually loops through the TEs and shifts the gradients a tiny bit around to achieve different TEs. And if we generate the sequence, so it runs the entire script again, including the check. So that's, that's actually makes it slow. Um, we didn't need to check. So in the meantime, I clone the sequence on the scanner. Uh, I do sequence install. So the sequence is now on the scanner. We scan and you see now the inner loop changes the timing that makes the sequence sound so strange. You see also something is happening in this window. So we receive the raw data now and can throw it at the, at the recon. And now, because it has multiple TEs, the recon script will also, so it shows you TEs, uh, images from single TEs, um, and also the phase difference between the first and the second echo, if you would like to use a kind of phase uh, uh, field mapping or whatever. Okay. So now what I was thinking about while preparing this uh, is uh, to, show you how, how easy it is actually to create other sequences. So if we say, um, we would like now to convert the sequence, which is sequence zero one, to the multi-gradient sequence with a single um, train of echoes, uh, it's just a few lines of uh, change. So we will basically now, uh, do something with high level parameters. We calculate new flyback gradients we will bring us back. Uh, and uh, there's more, you need some kind of, it, 
the timing calculation gets a tiny bit more tedious, um, uh, but it's basically fairly, fairly trivial. And uh, uh, with that, you can actually, well, you can actually uh, define your new sequence. Um, and uh, mm, let's have a look. So you see already on the plot that uh, single excitation is followed by the three gradients uh, readouts with a very powerful, very quick flyback gradients. Um, so if we, I, I can make this window bigger. Do you see it now, right? I hope you do. Yep. And we can so we can do sequence install. And we can run it. Okay, so now you notice the signal is actually faster because it acquires uh, all three echoes in the same TE. Um, and you can reconstruct the data again by uh, running the FFT reconscript. Um, right, so this is uh, really working fairly trivially. Um, now, if you go and do the next step, um, you can conf convert your sequence into a um, bipolar gradient. So you can get rid of those flyback gradients. And uh, to do that, um, it's actually, the sequence actually gets even a little bit more compact. Again, that's just very, very, very tiny changes uh, which you need to do. Okay, and we can generate the sequence. So now I'm actually skipping. Yeah. Oh, I'm in line. Can I see? The hand and scan is a little bit different. Yeah. See, it must. Also, I ask now. No, 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 fast, fast, fast. Um, I need to know a bit of time to do so. Maybe. Eh, I, I say it now. So, not that you then. That is, since the 15 students are present. Okay. Okay, so we are, we are slightly over time. I was told that the scanner will have scanner for the next 10, 15 minutes, uh, and this is totally fine. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to show you now, we generate a sequence and uh, we skip the checking steps, just install it on the Siemens scanner and run it so it runs again. And if you if you um, plot it, you will see it's now a bipolar gradient, but the case space still, still looks the same. So, but it, you see, we now have uh, positive and negative gradients. And if we had time, we could kind of squeeze in the timing a bit more to to make the echo timing uh, timing quicker, um, echo spacing quicker. Or we can uh, convert the segment into the segmented gradient echo. So again, we're now phasing code different segments um, differently. Uh, we can do that. And again, I'll, maybe in the interest of time, I skip the checking parts. You can see now the something have changed because now we segment the Sequence, we don't see much on this level, but if we zoom in, you can see, uh, well, that's, that's a little bit hard to say, to see what's happening in the corner of case space. We, we turn around and go back um, um, because we now encode all, all these uh, into the same case space. 
And if we do install, you will see that the image quality is not so good now. And that the reason for that would be uh, that our readout bandwidth is relatively low. This phantom has relatively high inhomogeneities. So now our different readouts are affected by the uh, inhomogeneities in different directions. If we increase the bandwidth of the sequence, that's a higher bandwidth version. Um, oh, now actually this, so you can see in case space, we use higher gradients. That's why we need more time to actually turn around and you now can appreciate this turning in case space, which we need to do. We also have five segments, so you can see what, what's going on and we turn around. Um, and um, you can also run that one. You see, because of the segment case space, the number of phase encoding step is really going down dramatically, so the sequence gets very fast. And uh, come on. Here is the image. So it's a, a lower resolution, high bandwidth, uh, multi uh, segment flash. Um, so um, I can go on. We can do a next step and try EPI, um, or you can go through the materials offline. That's probably better if, if, if we answer some questions at this point. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question um, to you. So. Um... Is it uh, planned in the future to support also um, PTX RF pulses in the interpreter, in the pulse second interpreter? Um, I, I would be totally supporting that. So I was thinking about it several times. Uh, we actually didn't have access to, to a PTX capable system in, in Vienna up until a few weeks ago. Um, it needs to be done. We don't have it. Don't have, uh, don't plan it on on our plans uh, because it's not a priority for us. But if somebody wants to implement it, we would be totally supporting it and would be happy to to help and to guide and to work together with you or whoever will uh, volunteers to uh, to contribute that. Uh, please please do that. So uh, there's no there's no principal constraints, but you you have to do that. It's just some work some work to be done. Okay, do we have more questions? Do you have uh, some limitation for 3D imaging in terms of size of the sequences? Or? Um, there are some limitations at some point. So if you go to, uh, to a micron resolution, uh, they will we'll have hard times running the sequence. In, in the currently released code, we actually provide an MPRH sequence with isotropic uh, resolution of one millimeter. So this is, this is doable. Um, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds to generate a sequence. So things get a little bit slower, um, but they're still manageable. So it's not like you, you really wait minutes. Uh, um, so, uh, and, and again, the nice thing is that these sequences can be pre-installed on the scanner and also ran in, in patients or study volunteers. So you don't have to regenerate them all the time. You can also have them pre-installed. And uh, for the construction part, uh, do you have plans to integrate a gadget one for example? Pardon me? And do you have plans to uh, connect to gadget one for the reconstruction? Well, we'd love to, yes, at some point. I, I, I think Martin has started that already. And uh, yes, we would like to integrate closely to Gadgetron. Um, also, I didn't have time to go through the recon scripts, but basically the nice thing is that you can take any data and because we have access, uh, 
to the trajectory. So the way I really like to do that is to figure out everything from the trajectory. You have seen in this example, we were changing the segmentation in case space and the data sorting uh, was just uh, working automatically. It's not like like that if you if you do it in idea from scratch. So um, um, we really like to keep this automatic things. And what we would like to do is to implement the uh, automatic uh, detection of the slice ordering and uh, case space ordering and links to um, to uh, Gadgetron and other tools. We already have very well established links to Bart. So again, uh, the online uh, repository, which we released just a few days ago, uh, has the BART recon example, which works for 2D and 3D uh, sequences, just fairly out of the box. Thank you. Hey, I had a small question. Um, thank you for the, the nice demo. Um, I think I posted it also in the, in the, in the, in the chat. Um, the seam, this install function is of course um, very cool. What kind of connection do you need to, uh, yeah, have this connection to your scanner? Well, <laughs> okay. So before that, I, I I need to say you know never try it at home. <laughs> well, but so in, in reality, um, uh, you need to connect. So the way how we implement it uh, for us, uh, we have a, uh, a router installed uh, in the in the internal network. So seven Tesla scanners have that already. All the scanners have that already for the uh, VD11E uh, uh, or C scanners that's typically no router, but you can actually ask Siemens to install a router for you. And then you can connect uh, your additional computer. It's actually a good idea to have a powerful reconstruction uh, computer connected uh, for if you're serious about prototyping, things like that. But you can also use, uh, you know, in, in, in all these examples, I, I basically ran out of, uh, out of a little Dell laptop. So uh, this is connected to the internal network, has an IP in the internal network of the scanner. And uh, then when I say sequence install, it basically uh, copies the sequence to the scanner. And then the data catcher script also in, uh, waits for the uh, connection in this internal network uh, to receive the data. Okay, thanks. Okay, now, now again, in, in, so somehow my, my Zoom got stuck in the, in the uh, sharing mode, at least the interface looks like sharing, so I couldn't see much of the uh, questions. Uh, Siemens ID interpreter somewhere online. There's a last, last question, if you will share the code, the MATLAB code for this hands-on session. This is completely shared. So again, uh, that was something I said in the beginning. So this, this whole hands-on, is shared on GitHub. Please, please just check out check out the uh, on their official uh, Pulsec web page. There is a link to the uh, session, and uh, that links to a, a dedicated uh, GitHub repository, which has uh, which has uh, the sequences and recon scripts, uh, and also links to the data. Okay, I need to leave the scanner. People are coming in. Uh, are there any more spontaneous questions? No. I hope. Maybe maybe one one last. So uh, as Kai mentioned, uh, he tries to support this uh, open library for the um, Pulse access files. Is there also any idea to do this for for the basic Pulse files? I mean, we have heard in the in the talks in the beginning already that people created some some spiral sequences and whatever. There are some examples in MATLAB, but for example, no spiral yet, I guess, or at least not in Python. Um, is there any plan to share all the yeah sequences? Yes, there, there are plans like that. We, 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 that's one of the uh, targets of our NH project where we, where we will develop some ready-made protocols and we'll share them and hope that people will contribute theirs. That, that will happen in the next year or two. Okay, perfect. Hey, so I would say at this point, I thank you, I thank everybody for the participation. I would really be kicked out from the scanner here. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, us directly. The email address is the uh, palsicmr at uh, uh, uniclinicprivatepine.de. 
uh, uh, .de. Uh, it's also linked on the web uh, page. Yeah, so whenever just, just drop me a line and we'll try to help.